<laughs> I would say sellers are nice, but most people in education didn't get into it for the money. So all things being equal, that's not going to be the one. If everything else truly was equal, sure, i go somewhere for an extra 10000 That's awesome. But rarely are all things equal. And when I'm looking at my pluses and my cons, that's not the one that makes me move or makes me stay. Because um, if it was, then I would leave entirely and be a, a consultant or a lawyer by now. Um, so I think community, collaboration, um, mentorship, that is really feeling like you have a place to give and a place to be um, supported. Is really important, and I think time actually is really significant. Like the institutional, and the, whether it's bells, where are we building in time for teachers to decompress together? Where are we building in time for teachers to have meaningful professional development? When we look at our days, um, there's there's very very clear implicit expectations. If a teacher is teaching from 7.45 until 2.45 with only 50 minutes of conference and a lunch, but we talk about how, especially in an urban setting, you should be contacting parents when there's discipline. Oh, and there's discipline in every class. And you need to be giving feedback on assignments and grades are expected to be twice a week and, 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 and. If you do that math, and with the time we give them in the day, there's pretty much no way to do that in less than a 14-hour workday. And I mean, I did, I've done the math just because I'm a masochist and I like to know this stuff. But I, I remember when I was in the classroom, I did the math of, okay, if this is about how many hours I work this week, and I multiplied it by the 40 weeks in the school year, and then I divided it by the 40-hour work week that I'm supposed to have. Like, how many weeks out of the year would I have worked? And it was, I want to say somewhere in the ballpark, of like 56 or 57 weeks. So the argument that, like, yeah, but you get the summers off is just, yeah. some, it's insulting is what yeah. it is. And it's that lack of feeling like a professional and that lack of, um, just honesty with teachers like you're not working eight hour days you're not working 10 hour days you you might have an eight hour day you might get to leave your class with the bell one day but you're probably grading papers from 8 a.m until 4 p.m on a saturday um and so i think that's a it's not it's not something i've seen done well yet anywhere to be honest it's not something apart i think from finland but i haven't been there myself uh, I just one of my former so go. one of my former colleagues in her Fulbright in Finland just a, a, this past year. So all of her posts, everything, I was just like, oh my god, they know what they're doing. Um, but I think there, there's an interview of Finnish teachers, yeah, and the person says in America the first thing they cut is um, the arts, music, and, and sports, and the audible gasp in the room. It's like. How dare you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, I get public education is publicly funded, but I was looking at a private school, and again, this is why would I have gone? I probably would have taken a pay cut, but I thought about applying to teach at a private school, and if I had gotten the job, I don't even remember if I put my resume in, but if I had actually made the move, the reason would not have been change in demographics, that would have been in the negative column for me, actually, and the socioeconomics would have been the negative, uh, location would have been in the negative, pay might have been negative, I didn't really take time to look, the only real positive was time, as an English teacher, I had a seven period day, and I would have either taught three or four of those, and had three or four as my planning period, because they acknowledge how much work it is to grade essays. And that was assuming average class sizes of 15 to 20 kids. So I would have been teaching 60 kids a day or a year at a time 
and be given two to three times the amount of time that I was having when I was teaching 120 to 200 kids. And that alone was like, oh, I would teach there. And everything else was in the negative. So I don't know. I feel like that's something we have to address. And especially when you're talking sustainability, I don't have kids that I need to go home to, but the people I know who have kids, who have a desire to have kids, uh-huh. that is a very real consideration. You can take touch it. my hot dog. No, I just licked my fingers. <laughs> um, Thank you. It's a very real consideration for them is, am I actually willing to sacrifice this much time with my small humans that I, you know, want to come home and see before they fall asleep? So that, um, I'm going out of order, but that kind of goes into my question on dealing with the stresses of the job. Yeah. Um, you talked about exercising, you talked about reading and spending time with friends, but how do you deal with the stresses of the job? And how, what positive and not so positive ways have you seen others deal with the stresses of, of being a principal behind the school? Um, I would say the positive ways I deal with stuff. In the moment, today, for instance, when I had a not so positive moment, I walked out of the office and I went and visited about 10 different classrooms of teachers that I knew I enjoyed watching, and classrooms where I knew there were students that I enjoyed seeing, because I just needed to be grounded in why I still love what I do. Um, I think having people that you care about, who you can talk to, check in with and safe people that you can complain to and say everything you need to say and know that they understand that it's a pleading feeling. It's not about the kid, the parent, the school, the teacher. It's just a frustration and you just got to get it out, but then you're back to good. Um, So, you know, usually that's not somebody from the school itself because that's just not a fair burden to put on someone else. Um... So having that quality time and having those trusted friends that can be that. Um, And then having things that you enjoy that are just totally distinct from work, whether it's hiking or cooking or whatever it might be. Not so healthy ways. I mean, you definitely see, I feel like there's probably a significant number of principals who use alcohol um, or food or exercise, perhaps. Um, but use those various habits to mask it. I wouldn't be surprised if school leaders have a higher rate of divorce than teachers or non school leaders. Um, I don't know. I've had two people tell me that their divorce was that the job wasn't the only reason, but one of the main reasons. A catalyst for what may or may not have happened otherwise. I know at least one person that would say that's true as well. Um, every single person has mentioned um, like that lack of work-life balance and the use of alcohol. Yeah. Okay, so let's see how many minutes we're we're good. We're good, we're good. Um so my theoretical framework is called applied critical leadership. Okay. And it's um empowering leaders through a social justice and equity lens, right? So I think we've kind of talked about social justice throughout this interview, but did you have conversations with your staff about race, class, inclusion, and tell me what that look and felt like. I think we had them 
without having them be limited only to that. I think a lot of what we did had that as an underpinning. Um, 